Sabancı Vakfı Mütevelli Heyeti Başkanı Sayın Güler Sabancı, üçüncü sektörün değerli temsilcileri, saygıdeğer konuklar, basınımızın değerli temsilcileri. Sabancı Vakfı tarafından düzenlenen Nesilden Nesile Hayırseverlik konulu seminerimize hoş geldiniz. Geleneksel hale gelen seminerlerimizin bu yıl beşincisini düzenliyoruz. Köklü geçmişlerinden aldıkları hayırseverlik mirasını günümüze taşıyan çok özel, çok değerli iki konumuz var bugün. Rockefeller ailesinden Dr. Peggy Delaney ve Michael Quattrone. Kendilerine tekrar hoş geldiniz diyorum. Programımıza başlamadan önce kısaca akış hakkında size bilgi vermek istiyorum. Sabancı Vakfı Mütevelli Heyeti Başkanı Sayın Güler Sabancı'nın açılış konuşmasından sonra konuşmacılarımızı size takdim edeceğim. Kendileri yaklaşık 15'er dakikalık birer sunuş yapacaklar. Sonra üçümüz söyleyişi formatında tart tartışmaya geçeceğiz. Kısa bir aradan sonra tartışmaya devam edeceğiz. Ardından soru cevap kısmına geçeceğiz. Şimdi Sabancı Vakfı Mütevelli Heyeti Başkanı Sayın Güler Sabancı'yı açılış konuşmasını yapmak üzere kürsüye davet ediyorum. Efendim günaydın Sayın Valim, değerli vakıf ve sivil toplum e, kuruluşlarının temsilcileri, saygıdeğer konuşmacılar, dostum Peggy Duhaney ve Michael Quartone, değerli misafirlerimiz, basınımızın değerli konukları, sevgili gençler. Evet bugün aramızda beni çok sevindiren ciddi bir genç grubumuz da var. Efendim Sabancı Center'a hoş geldiniz. Sabancı Vakfı Filantropi Seminerlerimizin beşincisini yapıyoruz bugün. Her sene beş senedir bunu yapmaya çalışıyoruz. Hepinizin katılımları ve gösterdiğiniz ilgi için hepinize teşekkür ediyorum. Geçen yılki seminerimizde hayırseverlik dünyayı değiştirebilir mi? Bu sorunun yanıtlarını aramıştık. Bu yıl ise nesilden nesile geçen hayırseverliği konuşacağız. Bu toplantıları, bu seminerleri 10 Aralık'a yakın yapıyoruz ve tercihen o günlere, o gün veya ona çok yakın yapıyoruz. Çünkü biliyoruz ki 10 Aralık Birleşmiş Milletler İnsan Hakları Günü ve yine inanıyoruz ki hayırseverlik çalışmalarının insan haklarının çok önemli bir yeri olduğuna inanıyoruz hayırseverlik çalışmalarının insan haklarında. Bugünkü konuşmacılarımız Sinergos Enstitüsü Yönetim Kurulu Başkanı Doktor Peggy Dulani ve oğlu Michael Quartone. Hepinizin bütün dünyanın bildiği Amerika'da ve dünyada zenginliğiyle ama bence daha da önemlisi en az zenginliğiyle hayırseverliğin bir sembolü olan Rockefeller ailesinin başı David Rockefeller'ın kızı dostum Peggy ve tabi onun torunu Michael. Kendi kişisel deneyimlerini ve hikayelerini ilham aldıkları konuları bizlerle paylaşacaklar. Kendilerine bir kez daha davetimizi kabul edip geldikleri için hepinizin huzurunda birlikte olduğumuz için teşekkür ediyorum. Değerli konuklar, bizim kültürümüzde, ülkemizin kültüründe de çok önemli bir parçasıdır hayırseverlik. Ve bize güç veren bir toplumsal miras olduğuna inanıyorum hayırseverliğin. Biz de Sabancı ailesi olarak bu kültürün bir parçasıyız. Bu kültürün içinde toplumsal gelişmeye katkıda bulunmanın en temel vazife olarak benimsendiği bir ailede yetiştik. Bizim için Hayırseverlik bir aile değerimizdir. Rahmetli Hacı Ömer dedem bu topraklardan kazandıklarımızı bu toprakların insanlarıyla paylaşmalıyız derdi. Bu ilkeyi benimsedik. Bugün bir araya gelmemize vesile olan sabakfımızın temellerini de babaannem Sadık Asabancı 37 yıl önce tüm mal varlığını bağışlayarak attı. Vakfımız bu temeller üzerinde tüm Sabancı ailesinin ve büyük saygıyla anıyorum tüm Sabancı çalışanlarının destekleriyle bugüne geldi. Türkiye'ye kazandırdığımız 120'den fazla kalıcı eser, 36 binin üzerinde burs, 800'ü aşkın ödül ve hibe programlarımız ile 
dokunduğumuz hayatları görerek paylaşmanın gücünü daha da fazla hissediyoruz. Hacı Ömer Sabancı'nın paylaşmak ilkesi, Sadık Hanım'ın öğretilerini nesilden nesile aktarmak için var gücümüzle çalışmaya devam ediyoruz. Değerli misafirlerimiz, nesilden nesile bu miras aktarılırken hayırseverlik anlayışı da değişiyor. Çünkü dünya değişiyor. Dünya değiştikçe sorunlar değişiyor ve gelişiyor. İhtiyaçlar çeşitleniyor. Bir vakfın toplumuna katkıda bulunması için toplumun ihtiyaçlarını yakından izliyor olması gerekiyor ve buna göre çalışmamız gerekiyor. Geçtiğimiz günlerde desteklediğimiz projelerin sahiplerini dinlediğimiz bir Ekim Zamanı isimli bir deneyim paylaşım toplantısı yaptık. Proje sahipleri, bizlere yaşadıkları deneyimleri ve dokundukları hayatların hikayelerini anlattılar. Bir kez daha sivil toplum kuruluşlarının bu çalışmalarda rolünün ne kadar önemli olduğunu gördük. Toplumsal değişim sivil toplum örgütlerinin çalışmaları olmadan gerçekleştirilemez. Demokratik ve gelişmiş bir ülkenin en temel üç gücü var. Biri güçlü devlet, diğeri etkin bir özel sektör, diğeri de aktif bir sivil toplum sektörü. Ve elbette ki bu üç aktörün arasında olan güçlü ortaklıklar, başarılı işbirlikleri günümüzde daha da önem kazanıyor. Çünkü toplumsal gelişme ancak beraber çalıştığımız zaman sürdürülebilir hale geliyor. Beraber çalışıyoruz, beraber üretiyoruz çözümleri. Vakfımızın bu alanda geldiği noktayı gurur verici buluyorum, bir örnek olarak görüyorum. Ve bu noktaya gelmesinde emeği geçen, vakıfta görev alan değerli arkadaşlarım Hüsnü Bey, Zerin Hanım, Filiz Hanım ve tüm vakıf çalışanlarına ve onları yürekten destekleyen Sabancı çalışanlarına da huzurunuzda teşekkür ediyorum. Gelecek nesiller için bırakabileceğimiz en önemli mirasın beraber çalışma kültürünün oluşması ve hayata geçmesi olduğunu düşünüyorum. Sağlıklı ve başarılı ortaklıklar kurmak ve yönetmek bizim kültürümüzde var. Gerek şirketlerimizde, gerek üniversitemizde, gerekse vakfımız aracılığıyla bunu gelecek nesillere aktarmak için çalışıyoruz. Bugün de gelecek nesillere böyle çalışmaları başarıyla aktarmış bir modeli sizlerle beraber bizler de ilgiyle izleyeceğiz ve dinleyeceğiz. Ve daha öğrenecek çok şeyimiz olduğunu da hep beraber göreceğiz. Bir kez daha bugünümüze katıldığınız, bizimle beraber bugünü paylaştığınız ve beraber öğrenme sürecine katıldığınız için Sabancı Vakfı adına hepinize çok teşekkür ediyorum. Ve bu toplantının hepimize, tüm hayırseverlere hayırlı olmasını diliyorum. Teşekkür ederim. Sayın Güler Sabancı'ya konuşması için teşekkür ediyoruz. Şimdi değerli konuşmacılarımızı size takdim etmek istiyorum. Dr. Peggy Delaney, yoksullukla mücadelede etkili, yerel odaklı ve katılımcı çözümler üreten Synergos Enstitüsü'nün kurucusu. 2001 yılında babası David Rockefeller ile birlikte Synergos bünyesinde Global Philanthropist Circle, küresel hayırseverliği ağ kurdu. Sayın Güler Sabancı'nın da dahil olduğu 25 ülkeden gelen 250'den fazla hayırseveri bir araya getiriyor. Şimdi çok kısaca hep beraber bu özel girişim hakkında iyi olanlardan deneyelim. Synergos means synergies, so it's really synergies between people addressing the, the, the problems at their roots. I always believe that the world will be a better place if uh, people will understand each other more. I think when you have people who can connect and believe in the right causes, a lot can be done. My dream has always been very, very wide and very profound and uh, very high. But I guess that my dream was in black and white. And after I met Synergos, my dream became a colorful dream.
My focus really, being Lebanese-born, is uh, to live in a more tolerant world, in a pluralistic uh, and, uh, and tolerant world. So that's really my, my, my dream. Joining Synergos was the most strategic thing my family did. We were helping to bring peace to Colombia, to create a more peaceful and equitable society. Synergos opened a whole new world for us. Thinking about Synergos, it made us think to be global. Maybe we're still working locally in Mexico, but we're global in our vision. We want people to be able to listen to children with curiosity with interest and uh, wanting to learn something from the child and make him a partner in the process. So you need to have a partnership, a social partnership, and Synergos is designed to support this kind of partnership for people who have specific ideas of what they want to do with the partnership. We were the first who had built permanent homes for the tsunami victims. Um, in Indonesia. You know, just as synagogues, I think we basically bridge uh, the sectors together and we find sort of solutions. These synergies and connections are so powerful that, that, that anything you put your mind to, you can actually do. We would have never been able to do this without this supportive group. It's opened doors for us. That's something that is um, uh, so valuable that it's hard to put a, a price on that. Evet, gerçekten çok ilham verici ve çok önemli bir oluşum. 250 kişi dünyanın bir her köşesinde değişim için çalışıyor, destekliyor ve beraber yapıyor bunu. Peggy, Sinergos'tan önce Birleşmiş Milletler, New York City Partnerships, Ford Vakfı, National Endowment for the Arts gibi kurumlarda sağlık, aile planlaması, gençlik ve eğitim alanlarında çalıştı. Yüksek lisansını Radcliffe Koleji'nden onur derecesiyle tamamlayan Peggy, doktorasını Harvard Üniversitesi Eğitim Fakültesi'nden aldı. Peggy, bugüne kadar Rockefeller Brothers Fund ve Africa America Institute gibi 30 farklı kurumun yönetim kurulunda yer almıştır. Peggy Delaney, sahneye davet etmek istiyorum. Diğer konumuz Michael Quattrone, Hearthfire isimli kuruluşun kurucusu ve Peggy'nin oğlu. Hearthfire, her insanın iç huzura ulaşması ve yaratıcı ifade ile liderliğini güçlendirmek üzere çalışmalar yapıyor. Northwestern Üniversitesi ve New School'dan mezun olan Michael, Johns Hopkins Üniversitesi'nde tiyatro, sanatlar ve etütler fakültesinde öğretim görevlisi olarak da çalıştı. New York Visible Tiyatrosu'nda sanat alanında çalışmalar yaptı ve yine New York'ta yazarların eserlerini sesli olarak paylaştıkları mekanın küratörlüğünü yaptı. Rhinoceros's Gergedanlar isimli kitabın yazarı olan Michael, şiirleri çeşitli dergi ve antoloji kitaplarında yer aldı. Michael Cotroni'yi de sahneye davet ediyorum. Evet, şimdi moderatör şapkamla öbür tarafa ve farklı bir dille geçiyorum. Buradan sonrası İngilizce ile devam edeceğiz. Herkesin sanırım kulaklıkları var. Yoksa dışarıdan temin edebilirsiniz. Yes. Okay. Are you on as well? Your microphones. Yes. Okay, good. Welcome. Such a pleasure, such an honor to have you here. Uh, this theme of philanthropy from generation to generation, I can't think of two more appropriate and inspiring people to have with us for this discussion. And we're just really excited that you're here. Uh, without further ado, uh, Peggy, uh, maybe we could start with your opening remarks and things you'd like to share with us about this subject. Thank you, Felice. Can everybody hear me? Good. Well, it's a great privilege to have been asked to speak <coughs> with this group uh, where the Sabanji family embodies so many of the principles that we'll talk about. And beyond that, it's an immense pleasure to share this platform with my son, Michael, of whom I'm so proud. So my initial remarks will lay the stage 
in setting out my thoughts on philanthropy, leadership, and values. We can talk more personally about how this has affected my family or yours later. As I'm sure you all know, the Greek root of the word philanthropy means love of humanity. Its essence involves so much more than money. So you may actually not be hearing me say very much about money in these remarks. I'm beginning with the following hypothesis, that in the kind of complicated societies in which we live today, with conflicts, crime, global warming, etc., we are all subject to fear. And fear, in my view, is the opposite of love. Fear closes the heart. It keeps us small, and one of our inner voices says, stay safe. But by staying safe, we often limit ourselves. We limit the risks that we take. So in order to make the kinds of contributions to the world as people and philanthropists, we need to know ourself in order to address our own fears to become the biggest, most whole, creative self we can, to be true leaders. We won't create that shift within ourselves or in the world by simply doing more. We need time to reflect, to understand ourselves better. Just as we don't pass on values by telling people things, but by how we are. So in transitioning to the theme of leadership, I might mention that at Synergos, we've been developing a concept which we call bridging leadership, the capacity to reach out across divides and bring people together. But perhaps because some of you come from business, I could place this in the context of some work by David McClelland and later by Dan Goleman on what's become known as emotional intelligence, or EQ. So some of the key aspects of EQ, emotional intelligence, have been studied. And it turns out that leaders, and now I'm talking about in businesses, with a high EQ quotient have 20% higher results than the norm. And leaders with a low EQ have 20% lower results than the norm. So we're not talking about an optional success factor. We're talking about a key leadership quality, which fits very much in the context of the bridging leadership concept that we've been working with. So what are some of the components of emotional intelligence that we can take into our lives that help form our values and that help form who we are as leaders. The first one is self-awareness. People who are self-aware are able to listen and understand their own internal voices. The voice that says, no, don't take that risk. That's too scary. Or the voice that says, I can do this. Or the voice that says, I want to be known for what I'm doing. That's the ego voice. If we have self-awareness, we're capable of assessing our own skills and our own values that we bring to the world. We can understand and transform our fears. There's a poem by Rumi, which I'm going to read in English, but will be translated in the original Turkish, that has as its essence the need to be aware of ourselves, and it's called the guest house. This being human is a guest house. Every morning a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness. Some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all, even if they are a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture. Still, greet each guest honorably. 
he may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice, meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whomever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. A second aspect of emotional intelligence entails self-management. This really pertains to impulse control. Sometimes things make us so mad, but is it in fact useful to simply blurt that out? Self-management enables us to reflect on the fact that we're having this angry or this sad impulse and to decide whether now is the time to express that or in what way we choose to express it. It enables us to be adaptable to change, to be comfortable with ambiguity, and most people who are able to self-manage also have a propensity for thoughtfulness and reflection. Next is empathy, a critical factor. It's the ability to place ourselves in others' shoes not to have the emotions of other people, but to understand the emotions of other people. And this helps us in creating teams, in creating collaboration, and in helping groups reach consensus, a critical skill in today's world. In terms of this globalizing world, it helps us in understanding dialogue cross-culturally, cross-sectorally, ideologically. Next is social skills. So people who have strong social skills tend to have a wide range of connections and networks, a knack for finding consensus. They tend to act by drawing people together in partnership, and they manage teams well. They're good persuaders. So if we're talking about transmitting to a next generation of family members or leaders, the capacity to navigate and lead in this complex world. What values do we need to hold and to model? I would put self-awareness as one of the strongest ones. And self-awareness implies transparency. I think about my mother who was a fairly intense and some might say unstable person. But as she began to understand herself, she was transparent with us in letting us know what was happening, how she understood herself. And that mitigated hugely against some of the effects that her volatility might have had on us. Secondly, integrity, which comes from awareness and means living the values that we espouse. Trust. Trust based on our experience of others, our experience of our children as being trustworthy. Trust generates trustworthiness. And empathy, reaching out to others or love. Some examples from my family and the transmission of values going back several generations. John D. Rockefeller, after probably the worst traumatic event in his life, which was called the Ludlow Massacre, when a company that he had something to do with had hired some security forces and there was a rebellion and many of the workers were killed. He asked his son to do a very difficult thing, which was to go and visit with the families of the miners who'd been killed. When his son did that, he demonstrated both the courage and also the empathy that was required to gain his father's trust so that his father at that point transferred his fortune into his son's keeping for the future philanthropy of the family. In, in our various family foundations, and Michael will speak more about this, the foundations have been set up with the intention of preparing the next generation of trusting the next generation so that not only the exact guidelines had to be followed, but the next generation were able to develop their own passions 
and begin funding the kinds of things that were relevant to their generation. And finally, from my father, I noticed in him a tendency to just meet lots of different kinds of people. And then it was as though he had a mental computer, a mental database, and he would connect people and he would refer from one person to another. I noticed that and I was drawn by his behavior, not because he was telling me about it, to that as a model for how to approach problems. And that was why I went to work at the New York City Partnership for five years, so that I could work with him directly and through that uh, be able to learn how to do that particular kind of bridging. With Michael, from whom you'll hear in a moment, it has been natural to me because of who he is, but perhaps also because of who I am, to trust his integrity, trust his passion, and that living his life and his passion would lead to his contribution of his best to the using his whole self to the world. And in a moment, you'll hear how amazingly that paid off. So to summarize, as you think about how any of this might apply to yourselves, start with yourself. Find time for yourself. We rush around so much. We're so concerned with doing, with solving. All of that is essential. But if we have our own reflective practice, practice, whether with guides or doing our own yoga practice or meditation practice, that is the process through which we become aware of our fears, of our limitations, of our longings, our inconsistencies, as well as our strengths and our passion. Find mentors whom you trust to give you honest feedback. Find or help create safe spaces where you and trusted others can risk sharing and trying out discussion about our fears and our dreams. Ask for feedback. Who you are from the inside out is your true message and your contribution to the world. Your children will learn from who you are and from how you behave more than from what you say. The same for people whom you lead model the change, or as Gandhi said, be the change you want to see. The results, the shift in the world, will follow. Thank you. That was a, a really wonderful contribution and a lot of lessons for us about bridging leadership and if we're talking about philanthropy from generation to generation. That's about building bridges between generations and what better way to do that, what only way to do that than through leadership. Um, in, in preparing for this seminar, which I have to say I had an amazingly inspiring time doing because you gave me such a great content to do it with, really opened a lot of doors in my mind and in my heart. Um, Michael, you, you said something, and I'm, I'm quoting here your, your email to me. You said that your greatest inspiration to make a positive impact on the world was, came from your own family. Uh, particularly your grandfather and your mother. So can we hear from you about how that has inspired you and what, your own, what, what kind of journey that has brought you to? Uh, first, I'd like to echo my mother's gratitude to Ms. Sabanji. Uh, there she is. <laughs> uh, the Sabanja Foundation uh, and uh, the family for having us here and Phillies to you for all the organizational work you've done in, in making it happen and for your kind introduction, thank you. It's a pleasure for me to be here in Istanbul. This is my first time with all of you and with my mother. <laughs> so I would like to share uh, some of my personal story which I hope will help explain who I am and illustrate my relationship with philanthropy and express some of my beliefs and practices. Perhaps my words are most directed to the younger generation in the audience who before they can practice giving may have to practice the more difficult art of receiving. As a member of the fifth generation of the Rockefeller family, I have been uh, given a great deal. 
but it was not always easy for me to accept. I was born into privilege. I am very grateful for and humbled by the many gifts and opportunities that have come with financial security and empowerment. Those things cannot be taken for granted. But with the gifts also came some challenges. The shoes I had to fill felt very big. <laughs> As I faced the peculiar circumstances of my life, I, was, I felt intimidated and divided. Uh, as well as blessed. I was asking myself questions like, who am I to deserve uh, so much when others have so little? How could I possibly live up to the expectations of my family, the world, and most of all of myself? My uncertainty was doubled because I had so much admiration and respect for the work my mother and grandfather were doing all over the world. I have always been so proud of them uh, and how, how well they've carried on our family's tradition. So they were an inspiration, but where did I fit in? I, I knew I was drawn to what seemed like a very different kind of work. <clears throat> I've never had the kind of mental computer that my mother described her father having, and that I know she has as well. Uh, from a very early age, I identified myself as an artist. My training in, and education are in music, acting, and poetry. So I was compelled to go inward before growing outward. That was my dilemma. It cannot be compared to problems like lack of food, shelter, clean water, fear of violence, persecution, or rape. But I knew if I wanted to help address those issues effectively and assume a place in my family, I had to start at home. Could I be true to myself and my family's legacy at the same time? I was not sure. So my response to my inheritance was to try to know myself as fully and deeply as possible. It was an exploration that suited my artistic nature very well and which my financial security helped underwrite. My first investment then was in myself. So here are some of the values that I brought to my investigation as an artist and what I love about the artistic way of, of life. Uh, they also speak to the self-awareness that my mother touched upon. First, artists are passionate about exploring the interior life of people, including themselves. Their work can reveal the mythic aspects of our daily lives, which is why we turn to poetry at moments uh, of great change, like birth and death or other rites of passage. Second, artists enjoy expressing all aspects of themselves. There is a freedom that performers have which liberates us all, even if we're just tapping our toe a little bit at the concert. For an artist, expression itself can turn a deep need into a great pleasure. Third, artists believe and live in a way the power of experience. They have inevitably been changed by the beauty of a natural landscape, transported by a story, felt music deeply or fallen into a painting, and they in turn have moved us in similar ways. And finally, artists practice. Their process is often open-ended and not strictly result-oriented, which is something very valuable in a commodified, result-oriented world. So the good news for me at this moment of dilemma in my life was that those passions were all of my own, and I had uh, some courage and a lot of support to pursue them, even when it was scary. I remember a handful of conversations with my mother over the last 15 years 
where I would check in with her and say, I love what I'm doing, this play that I'm in, or going back to school for poetry, uh, writing songs. It feels really right to me, but am I doing enough? I don't feel like I'm quite there yet, assuming this mantle. Well, I am forever grateful, Mom. <laughs> that time and again you encouraged me to trust myself. You said that by following my own unique path, I would arrive at the right place in the right time. And now I feel like you are right. And here we are. <laughs> All along it was up to me to value myself, and that was something that needed to happen before any kind of price tag could be affixed to me from the outside. And it was from exactly that place, the place of celebrating my own unique essence, that I was able to more fully embrace all that I had been given. At times, I had distanced myself from my family legacy because I did not know how, as an artist, to fit into it. Now I understand that the way I fit into it is as an artist. That's, a, in retrospect, seems like a very small shift of perception, but had to be experienced. So in September of this year, I launched a new nonprofit organization. It's called Hearthfire, and we offer uh, retreats, experiences designed to help people connect to their individual brilliance and to help them express themselves more wholeheartedly. I believe that by starting at home, by coming to know and care for ourselves, and sharing our gifts from that place of greater awareness, we can engender a more creative, compassionate, and joyful world. And even in the serious business, perhaps especially in the serious business of social change, social development and philanthropy, we need more creativity, more compassion, and more joy. So now the soul seeking and the heart sharing that I do both personally and with Hearthfire feels like the best possible evolution of the global networking, community bridge building, and leadership training my mother has been engaged in for 40 years. And, and what I've learned to arrive here uh, will be an ongoing, a lifelong process. So my inheritance itself was not the big gift. That's the lesson I'm taking. The big gift is what I have learned and who I have become in the process of learning to receive, to receive life. None of us chose the life in, into which we were born, but all of us can embrace it and, and make it our own. What I am most grateful for is the education, personal growth, and values that have resulted from the gifts and responsibilities that were bestowed upon me and for the guidance of my family. It may seem as though I have not spoken so much about philanthropy, and it's true there are more details I want to share about the David Rockefeller Fund, which is the small family foundation I serve, and my own organization. But uh, as my mother just said, philanthropy means uh, love of humanity. It's a giving of one's self, one's whole self. So the main point I would like to leave you with this morning is that knowing who you are, feeling who you are and what you have to offer the world, not just money, but all aspects of yourself, and feeling how you want to give it to the world. That self-knowledge, that passion, that creativity will give your philanthropy the most integrity, the most leverage, and the greatest sustainability. Thank you very much. That's beautiful. Really wonderful. Thank you so much for that. And I'm here scribbling some notes and also thinking, indeed, there's such a technical part of this work that we do get caught up in. 
and we forget that working with social change and with actors that are involved in social change, they have that heart space, that, that, that inward journey that they also need to do and take time to do. Mm. And we do get kind of focused a little bit too much on the technical. So uh, I'd like to just thank you again on behalf of myself and the foundation for these really personal um, contributions. Mm. Um, before we get into our discussion where maybe we will talk a little bit about the David Rockefeller Fund and other institutions that your family and yourselves have set up to pass on philanthropy from generation to generation. We wanted to share with our audience maybe just a little bit about this wonderful man who has influenced you so much, mm -hmm. and his name is David Rockefeller. And we have just a one minute clip of him talking about how his parents uh, affected him in his journey. So perhaps we can watch that just before we start. Age, I started going on trips uh, with my parents to various parts of the country and the world uh, and see things that they did and see how they went about philanthropy. My father really did teach me a lesson because pretty much everywhere he went, if he saw something that he felt needed to be done, he would get involved and do something about it and to a certain degree less than he said me, but I've done a little the same, and now Peggy is doing it in a much bigger way. A contribution which is a one-time contribution, uh, which was not followed up on, often didn't serve as useful a purpose. One of the important things about philanthropy is not to rely exclusively on one's own gifts, but rather you find um, something in There we go. I <laughs> just get to hear Peggy continuing. That's from, um, that's the three generations together uh, back in 2009 at, a, at an event organized by the Global Philanthropy Circle. So we wanted to have uh, Mr. Rockefeller's presence with us today a little bit, and that was our way of doing it. So uh, as we kind of move on a little bit to how your family has set up, let's say, institutions that have allowed you to even do your own exploration and to start thinking about how your philanthropy would take shape, um, maybe we could talk a little bit about some of those institutions and, and what they've done. Your family's philanthropy goes back to formally at least 1889, I believe, is when John D. Rockefeller Sr. made his first gift toward establishing the uh, University of Chicago. And, uh, and so on and so on uh, it goes. Uh, perhaps maybe we could start with uh, Michael just because of picking up on your comment about your involvement with the, with the fund. Yes. Uh, and you could tell us, how do you think your family, what are the, the best things that your family have done to institutionalize that philanthropy so that it can pass from generation to generation? Mm -hmm. Well, the, the fund that I am a, a sometimes board member of is called the David Rockefeller Fund. It's a, a small uh, foundation endowed by my grandfather, and um, the board consists mostly of his descendants. Uh, and our giving priorities reflect the interests and priorities of those descendants. So it's a very personal and a very focused forum for philanthropy. And because we have three generations of family members there in the meetings, it's also a wonderful learning space uh, where the younger members of the family can learn about what it means to be an effective board member, to get used to sitting at that long table and making those decisions, interacting with staff, uh, and finding their own ground to stand on in, and what they would like to support in the world. So it's been very valuable for me as a, a training ground in that way, and I think to my cousins as well. Uh, the, the giving areas for that foundation in particular are the arts, the environment, social justice or criminal justice, and community. Uh, and interestingly, the, the fund began as a mechanism for my grandfather to give back to the communities where he and his descendants reside in the United States. So it was a very organic way 
to um, be engaged with local communities. And as the fund grew, uh, so did our objectives and our um, idea that this would be a way to pass on our, our family values and traditions. And Peggy, this was also an important institution in your trajectory, but maybe there were also others in which you remember experiencing when your generation of your parents were kind of passing that on to you and getting you involved. Would you like to share mm. a little bit with, that, with us about that? Yes, I came on the board of the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, which was founded by my grandfather for his uh, sons and one daughter. And it was at the moment when they were beginning to bring on members of my generation, much with the same training uh, notion. That board, however, uh, was half uh, family members and half non-family members. So it was an interesting negotiation, not that the family was all united on one side and the non-family members on another, but it gave the opportunity for us to hear from very uh, good professionals and to negotiate so that we weren't just all expressing internal family preferences, but we were really looking at the issues from the perspective of a larger context of what's happening in the world and what was needed. Right. I'm sorry, are we having a problem with sound? Yeah. yeah. Can we address that? Are we good? Okay. It was, just, it was coming and going. Yeah. Sorry about that. But you were talking about how important that kind of training was for you in that experience. Yeah. And, and in actually, I, I did take a little bit of a look at the David Rockefeller Fund and thought it was interesting that there's a, there's a heading called risk-taking. And it says, we will not shy away from difficult social issues. Indeed, we believe that our greatest impact often results from taking on exactly those problems which more traditional funders tend to avoid. So it sounds like there are some values instilled in these organizations that actually also try to shape perhaps the way in which you approach these kinds of issues. Does anything come to mind in, in terms of that experience and, and how it's shaped the kind of things that you've decided to focus on in changing or promoting social pos uh, positive social change? So the, the issue I was just referring to is that in order to take risks, but at the same time not feel petrified about doing so, you need a safe space within which to do that. And I think that each of the generational foundations that we were talking about provided for that generation that opportunity. Mm -hmm. Well, kind of also building on your families, not only these institutions that have helped train, so to speak, and get involved different generations of your family, but um, I think uh, the fact that the Rockefeller family and the different philanthropies have also established a lot of institutions, like physical spaces, the University of Chicago, the Rockefeller University, the International House in New York, Bellagio, some of these places I've had the honor of actually being. And I find it quite interesting that through these experiences, you're, you're learning about that practice and philanthropy, but you're also focused very much in your own work on creating very different kinds of spaces, not necessarily institutional, but spaces where people come together to explore either their own journeys or explore collectively how their journey can actually make a difference in the world. Maybe we could uh, hear from you about some of those experiences and your reflections about the difference between that institutional space and that heart space, I guess we could call it. Well, you heard from some of the members of the Global Philanthropist Circle their perception of what it's like to operate within that space. And very much like what I just said about the foundations, we try to create an environment, whether it's with our philanthropist network or our civil society leaders network or our Arab world social innovators network, where people can come together, build trust among each other, and learn from each other so that when they go back into the world, which is a complicated and sometimes scary world, they, they feel that there's a group that has their back, mm. a group that is supporting them and who they can call on when they're having difficult issues. Mm. And do you see this also uh, passing on to their generations and these different individuals that you're working with? Are they able to create those spaces as well? Very much so. I think once you've once you have inhabited a safe space that allows you to venture out, the tendency is to then create that, whether it's within your own organization 
or in the organizations you support. Mm -hmm. it's, it's almost irresistible because it, it adds so much pleasure and joy and initiative and the willingness to take risks. Excellent. And Michael, on our way over here this morning, we were talking about, actually three of us were talking about how little time, oftentimes people working with social change and philanthropy and NGOs spend to reflect and to really understand what it is, the kind of impact they're having on the world and themselves. And, uh, and you were saying that some of the work that you're doing is specifically focusing on also creating that space. Maybe you could share with us just a little bit about your experiences and what exactly you're doing to help facilitate that. Yes, um, it goes back to giving and receiving. Um, and I, I told you already how inspired I was to witness my mother in all the work that she did. I saw how much she gave, and she was also the first place I probably witnessed that there are some tolls to working so hard and doing so much. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think I've learned from her journey and into mine that all of this giving uh, that everyone in this room is presumably interested in has to be sustainable. And in my view, the way we sustain it is to connect it to source within ourselves. That is, this, to remember who we are and why we want mm -hmm. to give what we want to give. That way, it becomes more sustainable. Uh, not that we should ever have to do it alone. I think there's a great power in a circle of people. Uh, and I've learned that uh, from my mother as well, that, that what a circle of people can do together, a trusting circle, is pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. So I am creating uh, those sorts of circles. Uh, I particularly enjoy creating them for people who then will take them far out into the world and, and, and feed their work. Because that's how I feel that my small, homegrown right. nonprofit has leverage out into the world and is making a broad impact. What this kind of inspires in me right now is that you come from a family with generations and generations of this kind of practice. And not everyone comes from families like that. So in a way, through your work, you're creating these spaces that as a collective can inspire one another, share those values of bridging leadership and engaging in philanthropy that kind of cross all kinds of borders uh, between different people and different cultures. Um, just before we uh, go for a, uh, a break, we have a special uh, gift, a special treat from Michael. <laughs> He's going to sing us a song that he wrote. And Michael, maybe you could tell us a little bit about why this was important for you today and what it's about. Because when we're in a circle, as we were just mentioning, uh, it's a, music can be a way to deepen the experience the way my mother's poem from Rumi also, I felt, allowed us to breathe and have that stillness between the words. So this is a song called One River, which uh, is a song about lineage and continuity. I wrote the song a year ago after my father's father died at 92 years old. And he and I had a strong connection. And I had prepared myself for his transition by spending time with him and bringing my children to visit him. And, and when he died, I felt some of his energy come into me. And it was a direct experience of ancest ancestral lineage in a way uh, that m my Western culture doesn't always necessarily <laughs> speak about. But my grandfather's passing also brought my father and I closer together. And I could witness my father as a son. I was moved by his grief and was aware that someday I would share this experience of losing a father. At the same time as all of this, I was reading a book called One River by the anthropologist and ethnobotanist named Wade Davis who is a crusader on behalf of the many indigenous languages and cultures and ways of knowing and being that uh, we are losing as, uh, as we disconnect from and destroy the, the ecosystem. So Wade Davis speaks of a diverse but unified field of all 
human experience and knowledge as a great ethnosphere. And the truth of that vision was both inspiration and comfort to me uh, at the time of losing my grandfather. So it worked its way into the song, and the song is called One River. Okay. Hello. I said, oh, Father, he lost a father. And it goes, it goes, it goes, it goes, it goes, goes, it goes, it goes, it goes. Oh, my father, he lost his father. I said, oh, my father, he lost his father. And it goes, it goes, it goes, it goes, it goes, it goes, it goes, it goes. We are one river. We are one great river. Yes, we are one river, and it flows. Oh, my mother, she lost her mother. I said, oh, my mother. She lost her mother, and it goes, it goes, it goes, it goes, it goes, it goes, it goes, it goes. We are one river, yes, we are one great river. Flows, it flows, it flows, it flows, it flows, it flows, and we have one mother, we have one great mother, yes, we share one mother, and she grows, she grows. She grows, she grows, she grows, she grows, she grows, she grows. We are one river, we are one great river. Yes, we are one river, and it flows. Thank you, Michael. And Thank now you. we can all flow to the coffee break, and we will be back in 15 minutes. So enjoy.
Okay, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the break. Um, we'd actually now like to open it up uh, to some of you for some questions and then kind of ta let the discussion take us that way. And Peggy said before uh, hearing your questions, she would like to start with a question to all of you. So let's let Peggy start the Q&A session. Peggy? So because this is only about my fourth or fifth visit to Turkey, I am not totally familiar with the way your organizations, foundations, et cetera, are structured. And I'm wondering if any of you can tell me what are the opportunities for the sort of safe spaces that we talked about earlier that can enable people to build trust among their own group and then from there go out and serve in the world. So if any of you have examples or comments that you'd like to make about that, I would love to hear them. Okay. So if I see some hands, perhaps, so some questions and comments related to this and also the morning session. Okay. Then I'll ask the question. I'll keep asking the questions. And <laughs> oh, answer. Ah, okay. Oh, oh. I get to be a, a, an audience member now. Wonderful. <laughs> Spaces. Uh, I have to admit that um, my time, I, I'd mentioned a little bit my time in uh, various Rockefeller institutions or institutions related to uh, the Rockefeller family. One was at the International House in New York, which was basically a place where graduate students stay and create a community. Um, the other one was the Bellagio Institute in, in Italy, which is a place where the Rockefeller Foundation brings people together to talk about different ideas. Another one is your ranch in Montana, in which I got to herd 400 cattle this summer, um, which was an amazing, different spiritual experience. So as you've noticed, all of these examples are outside of Turkey. Um, I really can't say that I have found a lot of spaces within Turkey, and just a colleague of mine, Ayla, from... Mother Child Education Foundation and I were talking about how we could start, and a lot of my team members as well, younger generation, talking about how we could start creating those spaces for us to really learn and reflect on what we're doing and, and our own journey within all of it. So I can't really say that I've been able to find a lot of that here per se. Well, let me phrase the question a different way and see if this provokes <clears throat> any answers. Um, whether it's in your family or in your friendship group that gets together after work on Friday afternoons and you take off your feet and you take off your shoes <laughs> and put your feet on the table. There, I'm sure that in every culture there are these safe spaces. Maybe they're not formal institutional spaces, mm. but does that trigger any thinking among anyone in the audience? Let's see. I see. A I hand. see a hand back there, two hands. Can you speak into the microphone, please? Selçuk Tarı, Kase Vakfı'ndan geliyorum. Bence birinci derecede önemli olan güvenli yer insanın ailesidir. Altyapı kültürü olarak eğer size bunu anne veya babanız ve özellikle anneniz verebiliyorsa siz zaten çocukluk döneminizde bir güven sahibi oluyorsunuz. O ilerisi bakımından size bir vizyon hazırlıyor. Bir insanın başarılı olabilmesinde Önce kendi özüne olan güveni ve en yakın kendisine en yakın olan kişilerin kendisine verdiği güven havasıdır. Ve bilir ki bundan sonraki mücadelelerimde o güven beni her zaman bir adım en azından bir adım önde tutacaktır. Bu sağlanmışsa en önemli vasıf birinci derecede de elde edilmiştir. Ondan sonra işin finansman kaynakları geliyor. Bunu temin etmede eğer ailenin bu yönden de bir katılımı yok ise o zaman ya arkadaşlık döneminizde ya da meslek hayatınızda sizin gibi düşünen kişilerle bir araya geldikçe zaten o hava kendiliğinden oluşmakta. Dolayısıyla çember gidikçe 
genişlemekte ve birey olarak toplum içinde e, toplumun size verdiklerinin karşılığında ben ne yapabilirim düşüncesine eriştikçe gücünüz ve güveniniz artmakta. Dolayısıyla e, ben siz daha bu soruyu sormadan ben size sormak istiyordum. Bizim bu tür çalışmalarımızda en büyük e, sıkıntımız kaynak elde etmekten kaynaklanıyor. Ve hala bunu zorluğunu çekiyoruz. Peki ben size sorsam, sizin böyle bir sorununuz olmadığını düşünsek, varsaysak, ailenin kaynağından kastederek bunu soruyorum. Acaba sizin için en büyük sorun ne olmuştu? Onu nasıl açtınız ve bu noktalara nasıl geldiniz? Ee, benim cevabım ve sorum bu olacak. Teşekkür ederim. Çok teşekkürler. Thank you. That was a very wonderful explanation and I'll be happy to take a crack at answering. You know, families are not perfect, none of them. And um, probably all of us are prepared for going out in the world by things that are less happy that happen in our family. I mentioned a little bit about my mother's instability which went along with her extraordinary creativity. But at a certain point, rather than resent what I didn't get from her, I came upon the concept that my greatest wound was also my greatest gift. She had amazing values, values for social justice and equity, fairness. And the fact that she couldn't always act consistently with that hurt me, but the hurt that I felt there later translated into empathy for other people who are hurt. And that, to me, has been the greatest gift that I got from her. And, I'm sorry. Microphone. Bir mikrofonu uzatabilir miyiz? Uh, on the shoes of under the shoes of somebody else but I, I listened to your speech you you mentioned Peggy that you should have an empathy but without getting emotional and that's very tough I think to yes. separate those two yes and it's not exactly uh, not getting emotional but not getting lost in the emotions of others so I make a distinction there you can feel what they're feeling but you don't take in your pain, their pain in a way that can become debilitating or toxic. So there's a certain way that you can hear it, you can resonate with it, you can be with the person without being so taken over by that person's pain that you become the pain itself. Before we go on, just there was this, just the second bit of that question that the gentleman had asked, which was they're struggling. They work with the elderly, this Kasev Foundation. And he was saying they were struggling with funding yes. and that this is probably not assumed that this wouldn't be a problem for you, yes. but maybe if it, maybe it is, and if not, what would be your greatest struggle in the, in the work that you're trying to achieve? Okay. Probably the greatest struggle is that in, in today's world, everything is about measuring impact. And Measuring impact is fundamental because when we're choosing between investing in this or investing in that, we want our time, other resources, and even dollars to go in the place where it'll have the most impact. But the themes that Michael and I have been talking about today are a little hard to measure. So in the nearly 25 years that I've been running Synergos, which by the way is an NGO, not a foundation, and we, we do raise money, and when there are recessions, we struggle with, with meeting our budget. Um, but uh, I don't put that as the biggest struggle, because I thought you were asking it's something. one that is common to almost everybody, and we do what we can. The, the greatest difficulty is communicating the need for taking the time to do the inner reflection 
in order to be more impactful out there. Michael, is there anything you'd like to add? I too have, have experienced what my mother mentions, which is a, a sense that because what we've been speaking about is less measurable, um, it sometimes feels like a luxury. Mm. But this is, in its own way, a very, very basic need for connection. Mm. And is also a very powerful tool to enable uh, all of us to provide for the more measurable basic needs. Mm. And I'll just put in my two cents before we take more questions. I'm glad to see so many hands. That the Sabanja Foundation and, and one of my primary roles within the foundation is to fund different NGOs and change makers, different individuals making a difference in their communities. And we often think that funding is their biggest challenge, but when we bring them together, we realize it's not. It's connecting with each other. It's learning from each other. It's sharing with each other. And we've started to do more of that convening, that it's not just about that check, that money that's going to make that project possible. When they finally get that money, they don't say, okay, our problems are over. It's more about now, how do we actually create change and bring people together? So. Uh, that's beginning to sound that. suspiciously like creating safe spaces. Yes, yes. <laughs> Institutionally, we are absolutely are starting to create those spaces. I have a promise to Engin Hanum, right? In the back, did I see? Yes, and, and then I'll, I'll move up my way up. Um, hello, this is Engin Akun. Uh, thank, you oh. thank you for the uh, beautiful uh, speech you both did. It was uh, very enlightening for most of us, all of us, I hope. Um, creating spaces, uh, this uh, concept is, uh, I think, has to be clarified by you. Are you born with a, uh, a space which is uh, safe or do you create, as you go along, the safe spaces? Um, uh, please uh, say something more about this. Thank you. I'm just going to take one or two more questions, if that's okay. okay. Can we just work our way up? Was there anyone in front of you? Ah, this gentleman here. We'll, okay, I'll we'll come to you and to you. Okay. Zarif Zeyrek, Beşiktaş Sakıp Sabancı Anadolu Lisesi Müdürü. Ben konuklarımıza teşekkür ediyorum ama bir konuda duygularını almak istiyorum. Davranışlarımızın bir dış görüntüsü, bir de iç görüntüsü var. Ülkemizde sağ elin verdiğini sol el doymasın veya tatlı bir dil, güzel, güler bir yüz, e, başa kakılan bir e, yardımdan daha güzeldir e, gibi veya kaşığıyla verip sapıyla gözünü çıkartmak gibi deyimler var. Davranışın, yardımseverliğin, veren ve alan açısından iç görüntüleri konusunda düşüncelerini öğrenmek istiyorum. Teşekkür ederim. Okay. Um... Yes. Have a, must be a student. Can you please say where you're from? Yes. I'm Khan again from Robert College. We are coming yes. from Robert College. Now, at Robert College, we have a community involvement project program. We have over 50 projects uh, from art to education of computer. We work with farm students, so, sorry, not students, but children of farm workers to in, educate them in uh, arts and sciences. I, do a debate program teaching uh, these kids debate. Great. And now, so that's our safe place where with our fellow students we go into places where we are very unfamiliar with. But we are only one school and we can only do uh, that much. And so we want to encourage other schools to actually start these projects. From your experiences from the Global Philanthropy Circle, can you tell us how actually we can encourage others to start such programs, mm. to start to create these safe places. Thank you. Really good question. One more and then we'll turn to you. Yes, Dean? No? Yeah, hi, I'm CB Paracharya from the European School of Management and Technology. Um, I found both your comments very inspiring and if I could take one thing away from that, it is that all of us can be effective social change agents if we have that inner self-awareness and the empathy 
Uh, it doesn't matter whether we have the inheritance or not to begin with. And that resonates with me uh, very deeply. But I work uh, not in the friendly world of NGOs uh, and foundations. I work in the, in the ugly world of corporations. We're and, sorry. And, uh, <laughs> and, and profit maximizers. <laughs> um, so when I work with, with uh, managers in those corporations and I try to teach them the value of, of sustainability and corporate responsibility and, and social change, they actually say, yes, it's all fine and good, but I really have to think you know, about my quarterly profit before I can think about anything else. And so there's always this tension between the short-term uh, maximization and the goal that one has to reach, as a result of which this inner reflection, the self-awareness, and all of that stuff gets uh, to the back burner and sooner or later thrown out the window. Uh, what advice would you have um, for someone uh, such as myself and others, all of us who are kind of working in companies so that we can um, kind of, you know, we can all row in the same direction. I was moved by your song about the river, but if all of us don't row in the same direction, if NGOs and corporations are, are not aligned, I'm not sure that we will be able to solve the, the trouble that we're in right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, I, I know there are more questions, and I promise there will be a second round, but we've collected four, and I think we can divide them in two, perhaps. One is, and I like this, very much the theme of spaces. So one great question was, are you born with this? How do you create them, or do you create them as you go along? Another question is about kind of the giving and the taking that takes place in this space. And from Robert College, uh, the question about how to encourage others to create such spaces. And then uh, maybe moving to a different, a little bit of a different theme, which is about, well, perhaps actually creating a mutual space between companies and NGOs and, and that perspective. So again, that could also be under the theme of space. So. Please, how you want to start? Sure, the first question, whether we are born with a safe space inside us or whether we have to create it, is that? Yes. Um, my understanding about this, my experience, is that we are all responsible for creating safe spaces inside ourselves to do the work that I've talked about. I don't think, uh, although we are all potentially born with, with a sense of what that is from the safety of the womb itself, um, it's hard to retain in real life through a childhood. Um, it does need to be modeled. I think that's the way we can learn to reintegrate our internal safe spaces uh, to see a model on the outside. The model then can hold uh, a sort of image or a container, which then helps us constellate internally that sense of safety and awareness. So that's my, my answer. So maybe I could take a crack at some of the other ones. About the question of essentially what do I think of anonymous giving. I think it's important that we keep our egos out of our giving. If in fact we measure our self-worth by the credit we get from others uh, for how much we give or to what we give, then we're not fully connected between ourselves and those with whom we're working. So. I appreciate if some people want to do it anonymously, that's great. The thing that they'll miss is acting as a model for others. So I also appreciate it when people are able to give, and by the way, I'm not only talking about money, when they're able to give and then not need to always claim the credit for it. It becomes more of a collaborative effort. Mm -hmm. uh, on the community service and the safe space, I've always advocated that, especially for young people, getting an experience outside our own background, whether it's within our own country or in another country, whether it's this kind of serving and teaching, is one of the most meaningful experiences. So any school or college that ever raises that question, I always encourage it. And I go back to be the change you want to see. 
So you will be modeling this among your peers and the gratification and the learning and the growth that you'll be getting from it should be, will be, a shining example for other friends who may be at other colleges. And through that, eventually, you and your colleagues, your friends, may be able to generate enough demand so that other colleges and schools do the same. But doing the service isn't always creating the safe space. So uh, what I would suggest is that you pay attention as you do this to what are the aspects of how you're doing it that make it this wonderful, trusted, safe space? And as you talk to others about it, whether it's professors or friends or family, that you emphasize those aspects, not only the act of community service. And then finally, on the very interesting question of how to get uh, corporations that are focusing mainly on the bottom line um, to be able to have the space and time to think about these issues, it has to start from the top. And who influences the top? Their peers. So in my view, the strategy would be find those corporate leaders who already believe this. And very often, by the way, they are the ones who are interested in learning um, uh, from schools of management or whatever. So find the right allies and then create the right fora in which those who may not yet be there in terms of corporate social responsibility or taking time for reflection to then act from the heart to be ultimately more impactful will begin to hear from their peers. But the other is presenting the data that I mentioned from David McClelland or Dan Goldman. I mean, there is actually evidence that the bottom line is better served by these methods. So if there are ways of bringing that data in, that's partly why I started with that, so that those of you who are used to thinking in that way wouldn't just think that I was being what we call in the US, woo-woo. <laughs> I, I do believe there is a paradigm shift that's happening even in corporate leadership, however slowly. Uh, but one resource you might look at too is uh, the writing of David White, who is a poet who brings his poetry to the corporate world and to organizational thinking. He has a book called The Heart Aroused, Poetry and the Heart of Corporate America. Yeah. I found that great poem on working together that he wrote for mm -hmm. Boeing. Mm, yeah. And it's, it's really inspiring and how you can bring those two things together indeed. And that was thanks to you. He's one of my heroes. Yeah. <laughs> I can see why. Okay. Um, I'm just going to allow people who haven't asked a question first, and then I'll come back to some. There's one in the, in the back, Zafar Bey, I think that is, if I can see properly. And we'll go down this line. I'll come back here. Uh, merhabalar. Çok teşekkür ediyoruz. Çok iyi bir toplantı oluyor. Ben her iki konuğumuza da aslında sormak istiyorum. Biraz değinildi ama yani etkiden bahsedildi. En çok etkiyi alacağımız alana yönelmek. Örneğin ben cezaevleri ile ilgili bir derneğin yönetim kurulundayım şu anda ve cezaevleri ile ilgili hemen hemen Türkiye'de özellikle iş adamlarının ya da fon kaynaklarının bir ilgisi yok. Yani bu etki sorun alanıyla ilgili bir etki mi yoksa alan küçük olabilir? Bizim bundan elde etmek istediğimiz etkiyi biraz daha açarsa sevineceğim açıkçası. Okay. Teşekkürler. Another question. Merhaba. Suat Özçağdaş. Ben de teşekkür ediyorum sunum için. Ee, önce sorunuzla ilgili olarak bir tespitimi paylaşmak istiyorum. Aslında bir araştırma sonucu. Ee, tipik bir belki de Akdeniz ülkesi olarak Türkiye'de informal ilişkiler olarak baktığımız zaman e, güven meselesinde bir sorun olmadığını görüyoruz. Fakat genelleştirilmiş güven araştırmalarına baktığımız zaman Türkiye'nin en temel probleminin genelleştirilmiş güven oranlarının e, bizim gibi gelişmekte olan birkaç ülke gibi Brezilya gibi de aynı zamanda çok düşük olduğunu görüyoruz. Bu bize kendi çevremizde tartışma sürecimizi yapmak istediğimizi kendimizi gerçekleştirmek için ortaya koymaya çalıştığımız projeleri belirlediğimizde ikili bir çizgiye getiriyor. Ya büyük bir kurumun çerçevesi içine girmek durumundasınız ki 
stratejilerini ve projelerini siz belirlemiyorsunuz ya da yeniden başlamak durumundasınız. Genellikle bizim Türkiye'de tercih ettiğimiz, o yüzden büyük vakıflarımız var. Çok büyük vakıflarımızda sorun yok. Dünya çapında çok büyük vakıflarımız var. E, Sabancı Vakfı gibi, başka vakıflar gibi. E, ama diğerlerinde sıkıntı yaşıyoruz ve fon meselesi de aslında o perspektifle devreye giriyor. E, bu arada tabii Sabancı Vakfı'nın bu e, sivil toplum örgütlerinin, küçük sivil toplum örgütlerinin desteklemesi, fark yaratanlar programı gibi alan için, özellikle küçük balık olarak ifade edilebilecek ama alanda çok e, yararlı ve doğrudan işler yapanlar için çok kritik. Buradan şuraya sıçramak isterim. Sorun da oradan geliyor aslında. E, i̇şsizliğin arttığı bir dünyada, nüfusun arttığı bir dünyada sosyal girişimcilik çok kritik bir rol oynuyor. Çünkü insanlar hayallerini gerçekleştirirken bir yandan da marketin dışında kalmak istemiyorlar. Para kazanmaları gerekiyor. Sosyal girişim bu ikisini buluşturan bir orta nokta gibi. Sinergos'un da bildiğim kadarıyla Orta Doğu ülkelerinde öncü bir takım sosyal girişimcilik projeleri var. Onlarla ilgili olarak paylaşırsanız ve Türkiye'ye bir perspektif sunabilecekseniz eğer önümüzdeki dönemde onu da duymak isterim. Çok teşekkür ederim. Okay. Biraz tercüme için vakit verelim. Is that okay? All right. Um, aynı temayı da ise alalım, yoksa bir sonraki turda farklı bir temayı. Tamam, okay. Let's stop there, because I think we've got two really big, two really big pieces uh, that you may want to address. Um, where would you like to start, or do you need me to? Is there anything that you didn't get about the questions that you need me to review? No, I, I oh, okay. Go okay, for we'll it. Uh, with regard to the prisons and. Uh, the fact that sometimes the corporate world doesn't see what the cost benefit of treating prisoners better or helping people not go back to prison. There's a very simple, effective argument. You calculate the cost of keeping someone in prison together with the risk that if their prison experience is very bad or there's no program to help them come out of prison, they'll go back to prison and again incur that cost. Versus the benefit to society, if they're not in prison, you don't pay that cost and they're becoming productive citizens by having a job. So sometimes when we're dealing with a question of impact, we have to go to statistics. Even though there's a human factor that we may not be able to express statistically, there's, there's a very strong economic argument for helping people who've unfortunately gotten into prison improve themselves so that when they go out, they don't either inflict more damage on society or a high cost to the government in managing the prisons. Um, on the other one, which I find very interesting, the question of whether the trust is only in informal relations. There's a political scientist named Robert Putnam who did his research about why Northern Italy was so much more effective than Southern Italy. The book was called Making Democracy Work. Mm -hmm. And he ran all kinds of correlations. And strangely enough, the two things that correlated most highly with the more effective society of Northern Italy were the number of football clubs and choral societies. So those are informal associations where people come together across divides. It doesn't matter what your financial circumstance is or what your political party is because you're doing something that gives you pleasure in joining together in that group. So if we consider that in terms of Turkey or Brazil, let's think about what the opportunities for getting together in those informal associations across divides are. And maybe that's something that one might pay attention to in terms of thinking about creating more of those opportunities. With regard to the part about social entrepreneurship, yes, we feel very strongly that not only do you need what we call bridging institutions, that is the kinds of organizations that can bring people together across divides and create safe spaces, but also the types of leaders who gravitate toward those kinds of institutions tend to have the internal qualities I spoke about earlier, but also the kind of entrepreneurial qualities that they will use either for business or for the public good. So promoting that kind of creativity, that kind of initiative, is something that I know that the Sabanji Foundation is very interested in doing by highlighting people who are social entrepreneurs 
and by rewarding them through the visibility and the grants that they get for doing their work. And because the Sabanji Foundation is very visible, it can influence others to work along similar lines. And I, I know that that's part of your objectives, and I strongly applaud that. Michael, would you like to add something? No, no. thank you. It, it is quite interesting, though. Public opinion surveys in Turkey show that one out of every three people believes that NGOs can make a difference in improving the society, and one out of every two people believe as an individual they can make a difference. So we have this kind of mixed picture, and I know what Suad is referring to, of issues with distrust and tolerance, but also an incredible sort of self-attributed influence that they can actually make a difference. So Turkey is actually, I think, has a lot of potential for these spaces. Um, I'm just going to take two more questions, and then we have another special treat from Michael to look forward to. Uh, I had promised you and you. Thank you very much. I also want to begin by thanking the Sabanji Foundation for uh, providing this very wonderful experience um, for the invitation to, to us. Um, um, the question I have is, um, in your foundation, how are decisions made? Could you maybe say something about the, um, the nature of decision making? Uh, the foundation that we have, the Family Foundation, Celal Bayar Vakfı, in the Board of Trustees, um, um, always there has to be the elected mayor and the village headman. They, have, they are the natural members of the, um, of the board. So I wonder how the board members are elected, how are decisions made. Uh, that would be very interesting for me. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And over here, just if we could just get it, your questions very briefly, please. Efendim, bu faydalı toplantı için ben de teşekkür ediyorum. E, şunu sormak istiyorum: Güvenli bir ortam yaratılmasında çalışmalar yaparken devletin yasal kuralları nedeniyle yardımcı olduklarını mı, yoksa bazı çalışmaların e, insanları hayırseverlikten biraz daha uzaklaştırmaya dönük çalışmalar da olup olmadıkların olmadığını kendi ülkelerinde böyle bir örnek var mı bunu bilmek istiyorum. Hmm. Okay. Actually they were quick so I'm going to give you the last question please. No, I'm sorry. Well, okay, you two and then the man the boy behind you. Can we please have microphones? Oh. Öncelikle teşekkür ediyorum. İsmail Ünlü Düşün Taşın Derneği temsilen buradayım. Ee, Düşün Taşın e, Bay Peki'ye sormak ve Bayan Peki'ye sormak istiyorum. E, söylediği bir söz vardı. İnsanlar çalışmaktan e, düşünecek vakit bulamıyorlar. E, haliyle e, hayırseverliğe de e, zaman ayıramıyorlar demişti. Biz de tam bu konu üzerine faaliyetler yürütüyoruz. E, dernek olarak e, pazar günleri e, 12 ile 15 arasında insanları düşünmeye, kitap okumaya ve kendilerini keşfetmeye davet ediyoruz. Bunun ismini de kitap okuma günleri diyoruz. Bunu da bu pazar 15 il ve Washington DC'de bir arkadaşımız vasıtasıyla yapacağız. Buradan Michael'a geçmek istiyorum. Sosyal sorumluluk, sosyal girişimcilik ve hayırseverlik işlerinde bu tür organizasyonlarda ben bir gencim, genç arkadaşlarıma hitap etmek istiyorum. Siz de bizim yaşımıza yakınsınız. Gençleri bu tür organizasyonların içine çekebilmek için hangi argümanları, hangi dokümanları kullanmalıyız? Nasıl bir yol izlemeyiz? Bu konuda tavsiyelerinizi teşekkür ediyorum. Okay. Son sorumuz da galiba bir öğrenci daha Robert'ten olabilir gibi hissim var. Yes, I'm also a student from Robert College. Okay. Um, you have mentioned in your speech that uh, we shouldn't fear risk-taking while doing uh, activities related to philanthropy. Uh, however, as high school students while doing projects, we want to make sure that we are safe in all aspects. In your experience, what, have been, what has been the limit of, your, of this risk-taking? Okay, thank you. So, we have a lot of different kinds of questions. One about how to mobilize youth, one about how to define and work with risk taking and so on. So, would you like to start, Michael? Gosh, how do we mobilize youth? 
uh, I'm always I'm always up for playing more songs. <laughs> <laughs> that really is uh, a, a, a very powerful community building tool. Gathering in a circle, as I've said before, whether it's uh, more or less formal, it can be so powerful. And to share stories, I think that when we really get to know each other in that way, then we're moved to uh, be in good relation to each other. And that can only expand the circle. So um, the arts are the way that I love to do that. Um, but, but stories are not just the arts. You know, telling stories in a circle is an ancient tradition in all cultures. And uh, it's not going to, to fade away anytime soon. Well, I think I need your help. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, because I believe the question was more towards the, the structures, the actual structures of governance. And I feel less equipped to, to maybe address that. Um, it is a very democratic process in, in, the, in the DR fund. Um, so there's a very consistent process of deliberation, uh, a move to vote, a second, and a, a collective vote. Um, board members are elected uh, to replace uh, previous board members. And uh, because it's a, a close family board, we um, family members have a schedule where we, where we plan to rotate on and off the board so that there, at any given moment, is a different combination of family members present. But there's also some continuity. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Okay, Peggy? Yes. So let me start with the limits to risk taking. <clears throat> Physical safety is important. So we need to bound what it is we take on, keeping ourselves physically safe. And that doesn't mean we don't go beyond our comfort zone. But similarly, we want to avoid a lot of trauma. And sometimes if we go too far beyond our comfort zone, it can be quite traumatic or frightening. So what I would suggest is that first of all, those decisions be taken collectively among the group and that you think of it as concentric circles so that maybe you start with something a bit more similar to your pre-existing experience. And as you become comfortable with that, you move further and further out. And in the process of doing that, as you're moving into other groups of people different from yourself, you're widening the circles of trust. So that if you have level one, two, three, four, and five, you've created the trust you need with levels one, two, and three, let's say, before you go to four. And then you build that trust with four, and then you go to five, so that your allies are broader and broader, and your comfort level is stronger and stronger. Uh, the thinking association, I think that sounds like a wonderful idea. I wasn't sure I heard what the question was, though. It was about youth. That was what Michael okay, addressed. Okay, so, so yeah. Michael already How to addressed that. Yeah, it's one of our change makers, but. Ah, uh, great. And then the question about the laws of the state that can either help or inhibit philanthropy. Um, so this is something that we've studied quite a bit because we work in many different societies. And I can give the example, for example, in, in Brazil, where there are not very good laws supporting the creation of foundations. In fact, what people do is fake it. They create institutes Mm. Because in order to have a foundation, you have to have a minimum of $2 million. Well, if you're a community foundation, how do you get the $2 million before you form the foundation? 
So I'm always looking for partners in the countries where we work. Again, it's a question of who influences whom. In Mexico, there was an interesting example where the laws were changed because the civil society and the business community work together to make proposals to government. And because the government then couldn't say to the business community, oh, you're just looking out for your own self-interest, or to the civil society, oh, you're not very effective or you have corruption, because the two of them came together with the same proposal, it was a much stronger case. So government, is formed to respond to its citizens, but sometimes it takes people coming together as unlikely partners in order to be able to in influence government to make the legislation more friendly for these kinds of initiatives. Right. Thank you. So we are nearing the end of the seminar, but before we do that, we have one uh, special poem to listen to. Uh, that Michael would like to share with us, and the theme is leadership, and in a sense it's very much related to this discussion about spaces. And I know we're running just a little bit over time, but forgive me because this is actually an important space right now, and I can see that from all of you and the questions and the comments that are coming that we can just maybe expand that space for two or three more minutes so we can listen to Michael and then uh, bring our seminar to a close. Thank you. This is a poem called For a Leader, it's by um, a man named John O'Donohue, who passed away th uh, three years ago, but was an Irish uh, poet and philosopher and brought his thinking to bear on, on organizational leadership as well. And he practices the, uh, the Irish art of blessing, which he calls um, making the invisible aspects of life more visible. So this is a book of his blessings and this is for a leader. May you have the grace and wisdom to act kindly, learning to distinguish between what is personal and what is not. May you be hospitable to criticism. May you never put yourself at the center of things. May you act not from arrogance, but out of service. May you work on yourself, building up and refining the ways of your mind. May those who work for you know you see and respect them. May you learn to cultivate the art of presence in order to engage with those who meet you. When someone fails or disappoints you, May the graciousness with which you engage be their stairway to renewal and refinement. May you treasure the gifts of the mind through reading and creative thinking so that you continue as a servant of the frontier where the new will draw its enrichment from the old and you never become a functionary. May you know the wisdom of deep listening, the healing of wholesome words, the encouragement of the, the appreciative gaze, the decorum of held dignity, the springtime edge of the bleak question. May you have a mind that loves frontiers so that you can evoke the bright fields that lie beyond the view of the regular eye. May you have good friends to mirror your blind spots. May leadership be for you a true adventure of growth. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, we'd like to close the seminar. We'd like to thank you all for coming. It was a real pleasure. Of course, the biggest thanks comes from the heart to Peggy and to Michael for coming all the way here to share yourselves with us. We're very grateful, and we wish you all a wonderful day. Thank you for coming. Thank you.